Charles just uh, measured my life in decades. Uh, I'm feeling a little decadent. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm really uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I, I really appreciate my wife coming. She um, she was here of her own free will, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm also really glad to see some old friends, uh, Mike Griffiths, Mike Johnson. Uh, Mike's out answering the phone, one of the mics is. And uh, it's, fun, it's fun to see people who are, as a matter of fact, that's him talking too loud probably. <laughs> um, I, I, this is all about, you asked uh, what language I was learning. I'm, I'm just going to swing right into this. and I have. I have prepared words, and so I'm going to read some, okay? And and if you yeah, tune out if it gets to be too much. Um, I'm learning new language. It's Russian, and I'm watching myself as a learner and as an instructional designer. That's an interesting experience. It's uh, and but I've got some thoughts that I'd like to share on my evolving understanding of uh, teaching and learning instruction. In effect, I've been taken back to uh, third grade because the language I'm learning has a new alphabet. I have to learn how to sound out new words for, in Russian, uh, this, this is the R sound, uh, this is the P sound, this is a sound that isn't even in our syllabary, it's Z, Z sound. And so I'm, I'm learning uh, how to read again. And it's, uh, oh, and, and this letter here has three different sounds depending on where it occurs in the word. And I'll, I'll show you that later. Okay, so, but I'm, I'm learning all, it's like I'm back with uh, playing with blocks again. Back to the level of three year old sounds, symbols. Uh, Structures, uh, sentence structures, they're all from Babel, as far as I'm concerned right now. <laughs> um, I am, however, highly self-motivated. From the moment that I realized that I would be learning a foreign language, I have had not just a desire, not just an urge, but a, a consuming desire to, to learn this language. I don't know where it came from. I think it has spiritual origins, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, so the first thing that I did, of course, uh, when uh, I realized that we were going to be learning Russian, Marsha's learning Russian also, uh, say something in Russian. Not common. I can be able to do it now. Common stuff is dead. No, that's dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she'll, I'll, I'll get beaten for that. <laughs> We, we acquired everything that the MTC had in stock, including uh, an LDS hymnal, everything in Russian, this dictionary here, as you can see. Um, there were quite a few resources. Um, many of these resources, uh, this one, this one, and this one, were uh, participated in by IPNT students. As a matter of fact, Ken Packer, who's going to be my mission president, uh, developed uh, these items here. <laughs> and so um, it's uh, the first lesson that I learned from this is um, that it's hard to eat your own dog food. <laughs> Stop and think about that. <laughs> we gave Ken a degree for work that he did in developing uh, this system, which is really, I think, quite good. But now, as a learner, I'm using this thing. And I can remember the sessions with Ken working over the rough drafts of these things. And his master's degree was on a Spanish version. His PhD was on, on uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, uh, uh, you know, four more languages to see if the instructional approach was portable across languages, which it was. And, uh, and, but it's, it's eating your own dog food is kind of hard. And that's one of the first things that I learned. Uh, you see things differently as a designer than you do as a learner. And I think that designers need to go back. I, I think that designers owe it to their students to go back and be learning something new all the time. 
so they can keep that freshness. Okay. So they, they gave us, uh, let's see, if I'm going to the right place. Oh, there were lots of online materials. They have a set of CDs. Okay, it is hard to eat your own dog food. One of the things they gave us uh, for an hour a week for each of these three people, Katie is our tutor, Ricky is our learning manager, and Svetlana is, is my study buddy. She lives up in Boise, and we, we Skype or telephone, and uh, she... Uh, it, it was it's kind of a very funny thing she's she's supposed to she's my conversational partner okay and uh, I, I just discovered recently um, that um, there are just like there's southern y'all and there's uh, you know New England uh, proper uh, kinds of dialects or uh, accents uh, well uh, Svetlana is from Belarus and and that's like you know being from Alabama and so I was pronouncing something to Katie who's my tutor and she said no 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 you've got that all wrong it, and she pronounced it correctly I said but Svetlana said and Katie said uh, okay so it's, it's very interesting <laughs> how much dimension there is in this Russian language okay so there are all kinds of resources uh, there are lots of uh, non LDS resources Orvo <coughs> pronounce words they they have Russian speakers you can hear the same word pronounced by several different speakers. The Google Translate, uh, you can get their robot to pronounce it, which isn't anything like Russian. It's more like, um, I, I don't know, something that I've never heard before. <laughs> but, but the translations will get you in the right place, and, and it's starting to be a little bit of a thesaurus. The way they created this was by going into a, a whole bunch of, uh, a huge body of United Nations documents. And uh, they they actually used abstraction from that database, uh, you know, uh, data mining, to create uh, their translations. Okay, so it's a new. Uh, okay, so I'm supposed to talk to a blank here for a second. Okay, so with these rich resources, the question became, where to begin? How do you learn a language when you have a textbook, plenty of textbooks, but no one is making you use it? How do you learn when there is no course syllabus, no schedule, and no final exam? Um, this is the Cyrillic alphabet. I had already assigned myself some self-instructional tasks. Uh, there was this, and I started memorizing individual letters. But then, as an instructional designer, I said, now wait a second, this is not the best approach. And so I, I took a different view of the subject matter. I started saying, there are some letters that have a familiar sound and a familiar letter, like A. Ah. I knew that already, so there was a list of letters I didn't have to learn again, and sounds. There were some that had a familiar sound, like je, but an unfamiliar symbol, so I had to learn a new association there. There were some letters that had a, an unfamiliar sound, like ch, did I get it right, ch? Yeah, no, probably not right. She's <laughs> Okay, so here's I, I want to say j x whatever x is for x for us, but it's it's j, and then there's some letters that are so unfamiliar and don't have a sound. It turns out, except they modify the sounds of other letters. Like if this had a big M in front of it, it would be we, or if it was t twe. Right? Yeah. But it doesn't make us it itself. It's kind of a weird letter. Okay, so um, what I learned from this was that subject matter can be simplified. Now, as instructional designers, we are not subject matter experts. We have an unusual relationship to the, the instruction that we're designing. We are not we're not qualified to express the subject matter, but what we should be adept at is seeing into the heart of the subject matter of the people that we're serving with and helping them to see an essential core that maybe they've missed that is instructionally relevant. This, this was a useful concept for me. It shortened the amount of time that I had to learn. It helped me to focus it helped me to focus my attention and gave me a specific learning task to accomplish. Now, 
the other thing that I learned is that because each of those four quadrants created, in effect, an instructional goal, a different instructional goal, I learned that instructional goals, and I, I knew this back when I was first designing an industry, instructional goals are an invention of the designer. They do not exist in concrete or carved in stone anywhere. They don't exist as realities. They're not universal. If, you, if you're teaching a three-year-old quantum physics, you create one instructional goal. If you're teaching a 30-year-old quantum physics, you express the goal differently, and the goal itself is different. Instructional goals are relative, not universal. Okay, and they're not true. They're definitely not true, so don't get in arguments about them. Okay, there are only 33 letters in the Cyrillic alphabet, so it was easy to know when that part of my learning task was over, or so I thought. <coughs> it's not just a matter, you know, like a third grader understands, O-U-G-H-T can be ought, thought, or, if you take the T off, though, if you take the word eat and you add H to it, all of a sudden it becomes heater. If you add a T to the front of that, it becomes theater. And it doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't follow logical rules. Well, Russian has that same kind of problem. Here's the word harasho. Uh, harasho. Harasho. O a uh. In the same word. Now, here's the trick that they play on you. This is supposed to have an accent over it. That is, when you speak it, it's supposed to have an accent. But they don't write it with the accent for you. And so, every time you encounter a word, you're trying to guess, where's the accent? And then you back up one letter, and that's the a, ah, and that's the uh. And everything after this o, oh, if there was another o oh back over here, it would be another uh. You have to do that while you're reading. That's kind of... So, I thought my task was over. It wasn't. Okay. The point is... Well, that's... You know, that's that point. Okay. So, um, anyway. Well, I'm on the wrong page. No wonder I can't make sense of it. Um, okay, so... One of the things... See, I, I thought when I learned the individual letters that I that I would be able to just read phonetically, because they all told me that it's a very phonetic language, and it is, very. But there are these little tricks. And so as soon as you solve one set of learning problems, all of a sudden a whole new set of learning problems occurs. And I, uh, I wasn't quite ready for that. But one of the things that it showed me was, I needed to know, as a self-directed learner, and I'm, I'm very much converted to the idea of self-directed learning, you'll see that. They need to know, the learner needs to know where they are with respect to what there is to be learned. Somehow a self-directed learner has to understand, since they're not being led step by step through a body of subject matter and instruction, there has to be a way for them to understand how much there is to learn and what that is so that they can arrange their own energies, so they can arrange their own efforts and organize their own time. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to provide orientation for the learner. If we want to create self-directed learners, we have to put into their hands the tools and information that they need to do the self-direction. Otherwise, all we're doing is perpetuating the instructional styles that they've been brought up on that are not learner-directed. Okay, so... Where did I start? Well, I start with copying things. This is one page of a, an entire thing that I've done exactly. I started, I said, okay, the first thing I probably ought to become familiar with as a prospective missionary is Joseph Smith's history and his relation of how he got the revelation, the first vision. So I started writing word for word out of uh, my uh, uh, triple combination, um, and I write the word down on every other line, and I had no idea what these words were. I was, you can see I was trying to learn the letters, how to write the letters, and then I would come back, and I would look at the features of individual words, and I would use a dictionary, or I would use the English version of it to 
to try to fill in. And there were some funny, on account of Chérez, Chérez, uh, Chérez, Chérez, yeah, see, you're my Russian expert. <laughs> uh, on account of that, this many gossip reports, malicious, and mischief were uh, launched, slated, in circulation concerning the growth and development Church Jesus Christ, Saints Holy, Latest Days, and it, all of a sudden a new, a new learning goal appears. They, they don't just take words in English and convert them into words in Russian. So there's, there's a whole different skill that you have to learn there is how do they express things. Um, that, that surprised me, and, and this opened my eyes to a whole bunch of things. Why was this important? It was important because it, it drew my attention to a whole new set of questions. And it became apparent to me that the driving force behind self-directed learning is questions. Questions in the mind of the learner, not questions in the mind of the designer, or not even questions that the designer asks the learner. It's questions that the learner forms because of this driving desire they have to learn. It's a whole different equation. It's a whole different energy equation from what we are taught. We're taught to specify your instructional objectives, select an appropriate instructional strategy, to lead the student through whatever experiences you decide are useful for them. In self-directed learning, the student has to come with desire. You don't motivate the student. The student is self-motivated. I've always wondered and marveled, actually, at uh, a, a thing that I saw. Uh, in, it's in the early version of uh, Gagné's uh, Conditions of Learning, where he says, you know, gain the attention of a learner. That's the first of the nine steps. He says, well, what you can do to do this, and it's a really short thing, it just shocked the heck out of me. He said, what you can do to do this is like, show them a picture of a car crash or something. <laughs> as, you know, as if you, what you're trying to do is startle the learner into paying attention to you. So I think he was confusing motivation with attention in that case, in that particular case. Now he added to that later in later versions of the book. Okay, but one of the things I learned from this copying exercise was to pay attention to what was going on. I paid attention at a higher, I, I had to go back, and because all these letters were unfamiliar, and and that that H there, that's an N sound. And so I was trying to sound out Pusheño. Pusheño. That's it? Pusheño? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was trying to sound these things out, and, and I went through page after page after page of doing this. I filled up almost the entire one of those composition books. And one of the conclusions that I, <laughs> that I came to was that drudgery is a part of the learning process. I was asking myself, is there any way I can take the drudgery out of learning? And, and stop and think. In the back of our minds as designers, we have that question. Can I take the drudgery out of this for a moment so I can streamline the way to knowledge. My, my conclusion is no, you can't, and you shouldn't take a certain amount of drudgery out of learning. Ask, ask me Kate Perkins yesterday. I created some drudgery for part of my advanced design course. One of the two groups wasn't performing the way I thought that they needed to be in order to reach the goal that I had in mind for them. <laughs> my goal. Unfortunately, I didn't get that goal to them. But the point is, there is a certain amount of drudgery involved in it. And if a learner doesn't, doesn't drudge, then there's, there's going to be something missing. If nothing else, the investment of time and energy that they spend. Okay, so, so now, um, I, let me try to illustrate this. There is a, a book written by Daniel Kahneman called thinking fast and slow. You can get it on Amazon, and I'm sure that there are used copies that you can get cheaply. He, he points out the fact that um, humans, by nature, are efficiency experts. That is, we don't invest any more energy in an activity than we absolutely have to. Learning 
is like pushing something uphill for humans. Learning requires lots of thought, lots of energy, lots of concentration. And, and by the way, your brain uses 40% of your body's oxygen, right? Why does it use 40% of your body's oxygen? Because it's, that's where all of your stuff is going. Do I hear, do I see a pregnancy for a comment? Yeah. No, it's the same, because we're full of hot air up there a lot. I was just talking for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, we use a lot of energy in our brain. That's because there's so much going on in there that, that we're using up oxygen thinking. And, and so we don't like to use more oxygen than we have to. So it's easy for you to contemplate. If I ask you the question, what's 2 plus 2? It, it just comes to you automatically. But if I ask you, what's 956 plus 428? You don't want to go there, and, and you're not even motivated to find the answer. 2 plus 2, 4 plus 4, 6 plus 6. See, you're, you're motivated to think in those terms. It's easy for you. But that other problem, you don't want to, you don't even want to deal with it. Okay, learning requires effort. And so we pursue learning of any amount of knowledge by making ourselves learn, even if the instructional designer has tried to make it easy for us. We have to make ourselves learn. We have to decide that we're going to learn. We have to be willing to put together, put forth some degree of effort to do it, and sustain that degree of effort. There will always be, this is my conclusion, this is the Gibbons principle, there will always be a certain amount of drudgery and unpleasantness in learning. If we continue to learn through the drudgery because we expect a higher payoff, we expect the reward to be greater than the effort that we expended, waiting for us on the other side. When we realize that we have learned, the feeling we get is almost spiritual, and I believe, therefore, that learning is a spiritual process, about which I'll say more. Back to the learning of the alphabet. Okay, I was copying things. I was copying, copying. New, as I did this, new, new language patterns became visible. For instance, I noticed as I was reading a, a, a kind of a set testimony that I was trying to measure, to memorize, there are three different, well, at least three different ways of putting the phrase Jesus Christos in, uh, Jesus Christ in a set, uh, oh that's, I love that. I just gone over, I just gone over a threshold. I didn't hesitate to say the word. I, I love that. Jesus Christos, Jesus Jesus Christa, and Jesus Christi. Um, now, you say, well, why? Okay, the answer lies in uh, a peculiarity of the Russian language, which is not fully realized in, a, in, a, in English. If I was talking about my car, I'd say, my car is broken, or I hate my car, or I throw stones at my car, or I don't think of my car, or I heap scorn on my car. <laughs> or, uh, I'm talking about your car, it's not mine. I've seen his car. There's no scorn there, is there? <laughs> dollar stands between my car and my bankruptcy. Um, now, we, we, we don't hesitate to use the word car in exactly the same form. However, if I was building sentences, these exact same sentences in Russian, I would have five different unique spellings of the word uh, machina. Where would I put the accent on that? Machina? Machina. It's on the I. Machina. 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 Machine, 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 and uh, machinon, 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 I think. Okay? Why is that? And I discovered this, you know, I, I discovered this back here. And I said, why is it spelled differently? Well, and my tutor pointed out to me, it's because there are different cases in Russian. There are six different cases in which you can put a noun. There's the nominative, I'm, I'm not going to try to identify which one. This is the instrumental, I believe. Uh, there's the genitive, the dative, the um, prepositional, and the accusative are the other ones. Okay? And so the point is, you know Russian, don't you? You're back there nodding. Yeah. Doing um, great. I'm, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so as, as I was doing the drudgery, all of a sudden new questions appeared to me. And, and it was like, uh, President Kimball used to talk about, and, and President uh, Hinckley also, you get to a certain place, you get to the top of a hill that you think you've climbed, and what's behind that hill is another hill to climb. And that's what it is for self-directed learning. Even though you think you have an orientation, you get to the top, you get to a plateau, and all of a sudden there's a new orientation for you to take in. Okay, so um, I started learning about that. I started learning about the fact that uh, verbs, uh, actually Russian is a very regular language. It's a beautiful, expressive language. Um, let me talk about that for just a second. Uh, here's my theory about why you need to dredge through things. The inconsistencies that I noted as I copied in my copybook raised questions. And without the questions, I have no motivation or occasion for learning. I didn't know there was something that I needed to know. Once I had questions, I had a strong desire to inquire myself and fill the gap. That's my theory of drudgery. Drudgery can show us something to attend to, which leads to questions, which leads to self-directing learning in a person who has desire. Perhaps I should try to connect this negative sounding idea with a positive principle that our prophets teach us to cultivate a strong work ethic. Learning is work, but if we are enjoying it, it, we forget that hardness and we invest ourselves in the task. If we have the habit of hard work, then learning is, is, is what we will do. Why is this important? Because designers often think they can design what the learner needs, including supplying motivation by putting nice pictures on the screen or by making the screen itself have a nice color combination or by you know, making it look fun or feel fun. They forget that the learner needs to learn what the learner needs first. Otherwise, we are answering questions that the learner does not yet have. Designers forget that. We think that if we just put something out there, learners will learn from it. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, and you can't make it interested in drinking, uh, even if you make the water look nice and blue. Okay, so the learner needs to know that they don't know something, to have a desire to fill the void, to have some idea about what needs to be learned, and to make a plan using the resources at hand, whatever resources they have. In classes and in mediated instruction, when learners resist, are disinterested, or give up, one possible explanation is that one of these four criteria is, has not been satisfied. Under those conditions, learning is simply too effortful. When the criteria are satisfied, desire will put the learner into the learning, and you not only won't have to negotiate with the learner, you won't be able to stop the learning from happening. That's something. You know, humans are learning beings. They're learning. They're curious. They all, they're all always taking in information. They're always curious. They want problems to solve. OK, now another blank slide. This perspective does not exist in current instructional design, literature, and doctrine. As a result, we designers spend a great deal of effort and research on strategizing. Much of the literature today in our field can be viewed in terms of strategies. See, I'm going to go away, and the rest of the faculty can set you straight after this. <laughs> get you back on track. Uh, get him, see what's kind of, you know, he, something happened to him while he was department chair. And it, it just it never was the same. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. <laughs> Watch out for Charles. <laughs> Much of the literature in today in our field can be viewed in terms of strategies and plans for bringing learners to learn as if they were reluctant to learn. I suggest instead the alternative view that we designers should focus on methods for raising earnest, earnest desire in the learner. I don't mean motivation, I mean desire. I, I, there's a difference between those. 
Desire means I want to learn it, so get out of my way kind of desire. We can't control all of the factors, but raising questions and posing problems that the learner will take seriously. I mean, how many times have you been in a class project where you say, man, nah, 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 I just got to get to the end of the semester. This project has no impact. There's no reason for me to be doing it other than if the professor decided on the project. Right? You've been there. Okay. So somehow the learner has to take this seriously. It has to be in their mind. It has to be consequential. There has to be a consequence for failing. The keys are convincing the learner uh, convincing the learner to take the problem seriously and having resources ready just at the point when the learner sees the need for them. That's a new concept of what you should design. Okay. Um, when I asked my tutors, what shall I do next, they would reply, what do you want to do next? It became clear that my main tool was a question. If I didn't ask a question, the tutors had no answers, and that's literally true. I've gotten halfway through the session with Katie, my tutor, and and uh, her end of the line would go dead. And I realized that at that point it was my time for me to ask another question of her. Because she didn't have a plan, which is fine. I, I discovered uh, also that the, ta the, the task of learning this language included reading, writing, understanding the spoken language, and speaking the language. And I'm sure much more Peter is much more attuned to the foreign languages. Many of you are, I think, Matt Bird. Matt okay. Bird, yeah. Matt Bird certainly is. And we have a number of students who are interested in languages in our department. I'm sure there are many more tasks that they could identify. Um, once again, this gave me multiple goals requiring me to allocate time for each goal, time and attention the multiplicity of resources necessitated, finding and selecting the right resource for the momentary task. And then all of a sudden, um, what I found was that no one source was appropriate for, they weren't appropriately paced, they weren't appropriately segmented, they weren't appropriately focused on the task and scope that I had chosen. So. So it turns out that all of them, all of them were appropriate, but not all at the same time. And I had to decide how to, you know, we talk about data mining where we go in and we aggressively address a body of literature, of uh, data. Maybe, maybe instructional designers ought to have the mindset of knowledge mining or uh, subject matter mining, where we think of a self-directed learner who's going in and attacking a body of knowledge instead of us thinking that we should stand between the learner and the knowledge. Okay, this revealed a contradiction between my learning self and my designer self. On the one hand, I wanted something that was tailored to my momentary need. I want, see, I, we all have this concept. I can just, I can create something that the learner wants right at the moment they want it. But I also realized that my needs were changing moment by moment. As I formed questions, no single set of materials could possibly have met my needs because they were changing. I, how fast did my questions change? I found them changing minute by minute. I found that in the pursuit of answering one question, I had to answer another question first. And that would crop up, and in the quest for that, answering that one, another one would appear. Question changing in this manner was very common. My designer self asked, how could a designer possibly anticipate all of the possible questions that would be generated by a given learner at a given moment? It became clear that nothing I could have designed myself, specifically as a single product, would have been adequate. And therefore, nothing that I could design as a single product would support a self-directed learner. That makes a lot of the faculty feel uncomfortable. I think it makes a lot of you feel uncomfortable. It should. Because we have accepted we have accepted the premise that was handed to us. I think that we need to turn over a few more stones. I think that we've accepted a doctrine that was laid down at least 50 years ago. 
and maybe even before that. Maybe it was a hundred years ago when people who undertook to design instructional educational materials decided they knew better how learners should learn. I, I think we have to question that premise. Uh, in this respect, I noticed that each of the products, well, wait, I've said all that. I don't need to say that again. Um, as a self-directed learner now, I can't imagine having to take a course in Russian as a requirement, <coughs> as a required course, and working with only one set of materials and designed experiences. I can imagine what effect that would have on my own motivation, especially if I had to move at the pace dictated by the instructor and take a test at the end. Instead, I have a sense that everything I learned will have a purpose, and I can't learn fast enough. I do. I, I have this hunger to understand this thing, this, this thing out there that just begs me to understand it. I finally came to the point where I felt that I had touched at the bottom, at least for a moment, in my study of the language. The core principles of language are elegant, I believe. And they're illustrated here. This is, a, this is a noun, this is a verb, and it turns out that in both of them there is a root. And that root is multi-purpose. And you say, wow, that's, that's kind of an interesting concept. I wish it existed in English, but it does exist in English. We have roots of words, we add prefixes, we add suffixes to them. So one of the ways of attacking Russian is to understand something about the roots and understand under what conditions you add prefixes and suffixes. By the way, this is, this is a place where, uh, once again, you need to be aware though of where the accent is placed. If you put the accent here, it means flower, right? If you put the accent here, it means torture. <laughs> so I was, I was, uh, I, I was uh, trying to make some sentences for my tutor to show that I could build a sentence in Russian after five months of study. That I could build a sentence. It's a, that's a steep learning curve. Uh, and I was putting the, I was putting the accent in the wrong place. And and the sentence I created was, I I usually cook using. Uh, Muku is the way that I said it, which is, I usually cook using torture. <laughs> uh, it should be Muku. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, one of the things that my tutor showed me was that uh, certain principles... That, so, so, how do we approach the core of a subject matter? If we're going to design something, we still have to approach the core of the subject matter. Or as a self-directed learner, we have to find out what the core is. What are the essential principles? What's, what's tree and what's forest? We have, to keep the, we have to keep those in mind. This summarizes nouns and pronouns and adjectives. Okay? If you understand the cases, which takes a little while, and you understand the masculine, neuter, feminine, and plural aspects of a noun, Okay. Then you can actually create <coughs> noun words roughly using this table. Okay. So there in one place is something that I can use as a resource. This is a description of the cases. It's unbelievably complicated, but there's a sense to it. So if you're using a noun in the subject uh, place in a sentence, you use the nominative case. If you're using a uh, direct object, you use accusative case. Uh, is a dative case is the indirect object. Uh, genitive case is anything that's, that has the sense of using the preposition of and the other cases. Now, here's this fine print. Each one of these has certain, this one has 10 prepositions that are the hallmark of this one. This one has 40 prepositions, this one has uh, seven prepositions, and this one has six prepositions. So in addition to the general sense of each case, you have to understand what pronoun your noun is following, or what preposition your noun is following. So it's not as simple as it looks. 
But if you if you understand the cases and you understand that chart, you can deal with nouns. Here's a chart that allows, allows you to deal with verbs. Okay, so you get to the root principles of the thing. The idea that there is a root, that there are prefixes and suffixes, and that you build words in the Russian language. And there's all the prepositions, and they don't mean the same as they do in English. They're, they they tend to have specialized meanings. Uh, okay, so is this pretty exciting stuff? It is for me because I'm I'm interested in learning this. Okay. Um, so I have okay. a question. Yeah. So how do we do that? So you have desire, nobody can stop you. None of us could convince you that this is gonna it's all a waste of your time. Like you know, like you're you're gonna you're gonna do it no matter what. Gonna fight through. Um, whereas a year ago today, probably couldn't have convinced you to try to learn Russian, right? I had no purpose for it. Yeah, right. And so, I guess as a designer, what implications does that have for us? Because a lot of that's way out of our control, right? Uh, as far as desire of the learner to learn the material. So, that, any any insight on that? Um, yes. That's why I said that one of the major studies of an instructional designer should be how to create desire. That's different. Most of us think that what we're creating is PowerPoint slides or uh, nice videos or whatever. Maybe videos help. Maybe PowerPoint slides can help. But we have to, we have to think of ourselves in terms of, of uh, creating desire. Okay, I'm going to move ahead here. Uh, learning is a process of creative. Uh, creative effort and problem solving. It consumes energy and it involves emotion. And ours on this question of is emotion, how is emotion related to learning? Just remember that there's a part of your brain that as an infant you start using as the switchboard of your learning and memory processes. And that switchboard never is cut out of the learning process, even as an old adult. It's still in that circuit. Emotion is the moderator of learning. Okay? So, these, these are not necessarily new insights about learning, but they can more appropriately be considered new insights about the proportional importance of principles that we have always known about learning and instruction, but that we were willing to ignore. Some of the more mechanical principles that we have relied on in the past to advance instructional design practice are not as important as we thought they were. And other principles appear to me now to be much more important proportionally and therefore much more deserving of the designer's attention. Not only in the early stages of a, a single design project, but in the training of designers, of new designers as well. And that's why I'm saying these things to you, new designers. I'm trying to create a revolution in your thinking, if you will. <coughs> um, what I've learned about design, what have I learned about design from this whole experience, and I'm going to be done in about two minutes. I believe that our ideas of learning, about learning, are primitive and lack spirituality. A designer should constantly be learning something and should be a teacher, as should be a teacher. Learners and teachers should learn together. A course where this does not happen and where the learners do not realize that it has happened is a wasted opportunity to teach the spiritual dimension of learning. Frequently at the beginning of a course, I say to the students, sometime during this course, we're going to learn something that neither one of us knew before. And that's, that's why courses can lead to papers. And then when it happens, the students forget that and you start motoring through the course. And you get to the point in the course where that has happened, where both of you realize, we didn't know this before. We have now created some new knowledge together. I point that out to the students. And I think in some cases, it actually has made an impression. Mm -hmm. um, Second, since we cannot anticipate the momentary state of the learner and their questions, we should perhaps stop trying to do so. I, this is radical. At the level that we have been doing in the past. Um, 
the concept of self-contained instruction package that goes back to the 50s and before has been largely discredited, but its shadow lingers in our design documents. We still think that we can create self-contained learning packages that actually not just convey information, but that satisfy a desire to learn or that create that aha, that transformative moment. It is very likely that we over-design and over-anticipate the learner. The learner is a much more complex and interesting being than the cardboard cutouts that many of our designers today design for. They have emotional states. They have sequences of emotional states. They have energy levels. And they have attentional processes. We have to teach these as a part of instructional design. As designers, we have developed a kind of designer arrogance, and I have been guilty of it. Designers forget that they don't cause learning. We can only invite, entice, suggest, influence, and afford. And we do not have good doctors for doing that today. Learning is an agentive process. But the critical agency lies within the learner, not the designer. The process of learning grows in my mind as a spiritual process. Since coming to BYU, I have felt this strongly. During this period of language learning, I've come to realize the importance of the gifts of the Spirit, and in particular, the gifts of tongues, which they recommend to missionaries that they ask for. In the very first page, they say, we, as you study this language, be sure to ask the Lord for the gift of tongues. We sometimes think of the gift of tongues in terms of a sudden, miraculous, charismatic, and visible event. We think of Peter of Pentecost. I think now in terms of fast gifts and slow gifts, gifts that can happen as an occasion, and gifts that can happen almost without us noticing. Those of us who teach at BYU, and especially I, I the IPMT department, should become very aware of learning as a spiritual process and if anyone should be interested in the interaction between the spirit and the mechanisms of human learning, it should be us. And that's all I have to say on that subject. So, thank you very much. I, I want to thank I want to thank the students for being patient with me as an instructor. I admire you guys so much. I admire the faculty that we have so much, and I'm so enthusiastic about the future of this department and what it can contribute way beyond what other departments can contribute if they'll put their shoulder to the right wheel. I bear my testimony that the gospel is true and that it is okay here to teach spirituality as well as the doctrines of secularism. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.